and hello you guys so i am really excited to see you again let me turn that music off you don't mind it's great to have you back with us again for another advancing your photography live stream and i am as we say in california i am stoked again which just means very excited to bring another amazing guest to you. And today we're going to hear from uh, Sean Tucker. Sorry, I'm pushing buttons and sometimes that's distracting. But I want to tell you about Sean. So he is uh, an outstanding photographer. You can see here, this is just a small sample of his work. You should definitely check out his Instagram and his website. You'll see a lot more depth here in terms of uh, what he shoots and how he shoots and his philosophy behind that. He's a photographer, filmmaker, a storyteller, and as he puts it, an armchair philosopher, but I don't find him so much of an armchair philosopher. I find him as a, a working philosopher, and that's reflected in his videos. You'll often see he has really beautiful quotes against a very cinematic background. He said, and this really resonates with one of our main themes on advancing your photography. He said, at heart, I'm a storyteller. For me, photography and filmmaking reaches its zenith when it's used to tell great stories. Awesome. And Sean, it is wonderful to have you with us on advancing your photography. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So listen, let's just dive in here. And first of all, what is it that really drives you in terms of photography? What's your passion? Uh, in terms of in terms of genres, it's probably portraits first. Like that's my first love uh, is portrait photography. Um, and I think it's uh, I know it's a love of good visuals. It's a love of uh, something pleasing and, and also, you know, something with a story buried in it or something I can access beyond a technically well shot photograph. Um, I mean, I actually, I actually came to photography. Uh, not many people know this. I came to photography after video. Actually, I started in video first. I didn't know. Um, and this is, yeah, back in, back when I was living in South Africa and I, I, I worked for the church for years. Um, I left the church, but while I was working for the church, I was doing work on the side to try and bring in a little bit of extra money because they, no surprise, they don't pay incredibly well. So I need to sort of subsidize my income somehow and ended up just doing videos for, for corporates and training videos. And that's how I, I even once had to do a training video for an abattoir, which was a, quite an experience. Wow. And started doing um, videos on... Uh, youth camps as well, like instead of capturing kids hanging out for the weekend and cutting DVDs that they could take home as well and remember the time. So that's where it began. And I really got into then starting to shoot little vignettes around the city for myself just with B-roll. I think I picked up the original Canon 550D and a, and a 50 mil prime and started running around just with that and just getting like really nice, sort of trying to make it as cinematic as possible. And then photography happened more when I left the church and sort of had to work out how was I going to make or, or, or start a new career and I just I was about 30 years old at the time so I had to work out okay how am I going to build something new from scratch and someone had said to me well you know you already love taking photographs and making films so why don't you try and make that a job and then uh, yeah it was food photography for a while and and uh, portrait stuff just on the side for fun and then it became product photography and I suppose like I, at the beginning, I loved the challenge. Just how do I, how do I, because I think anyone, especially if you do studio photography and things like uh, food photography or products or portraits where you're using strobes, especially, it's problem solving. It's constant problem solving. Totally. So why does this light do that? Why did it do that when I didn't expect it to? And working out how to get to the thing you pre visualized. Part of that, like problem solving, I loved. Um, and that kind of juiced me up for a while, sort of while I learned. And then when you, st I, I think everyone sort of hits a phase in their journey where they kind of have most of the technical stuff in hand. Not that they know everything, but you yeah. know, you know everything to get the job done for all the things that you do. Basically, you can get it done with your eyes closed. It's automatic. That you start to ask yourself the deeper question, and you go, "Well, well, I know how to use this thing in my hand, but what do I point it at?" And that then became 
okay, now, and this is newer than I'd like to admit, really, it, it, it is to choose now what to point it at as the next journey. And that's why I wrote that on my website. It was more aspirational than the fact that it's real today, because I don't think my images do tell enough stories. I think I'm, I'm learning slowly as I go through street photography and portrait photography in particular, and the sort of mess of stuff that happens in between. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, once you have figured out what your camera is supposed to do, then you look outward and your vision takes over and you and you look for that story, that moment that is unique and something that you saw. Mm. I'm going to do this slightly backwards. I'm going to welcome some of the people who have joined us from all over the world here. Um, so we have Gabrielle from south of Brazil. Awesome. Someday I need to go there and do some surfing. We have Victor from Portugal. We have Uzar from Pakistan. Uh, we have Kyle from Dallas, Texas. Welcome, you guys. We have uh, Stephen from Lebanon. Annika, you're back again. Hello. Uh, Anka, rather. So, uh, UK, so right near you. Uh, we have uh, Sudan, Neil doesn't say where he's from, but welcome all you guys. And I want to tell you something. I should have mentioned this earlier, but I just got an email this morning from Bay Photo. They are uh, our awesome uh, printing facility near us right here. You can see them on the web, but they're giving away a 16 by 24 metal print with a kind of a cool float mount. And if you've never printed your stuff on metal, it's pretty stunning. So we're going to pick somebody later in the show. So just to let you know. Okay, Sean, so let's let's look at your method and what you do. So you, you kind of gave us an insight into this, but what are some of the key points that you use every time you pick up a camera or even before you pick up a camera? Um, it's, it's different for different sorts of photography that I do. So if it's street photography, it's, it's, it's fairly simple and intuitive now. So I'm, I'm drawn to uh, interesting shadows and shapes. So some of the stuff that I do on the street, especially that I post on Instagram, is quite abstract. Um, and I will, I'll walk and I have to have good light for that sort of photography. So those, I know when the light is good, it's coming up in the weather, but those are the days I'm going to be out trying to get that sort of stuff. And, um, I've actually got here Hang on a second. Oh yeah. Um, I've got, this is the little camera I use for, for my street photography. What is it's that? a, it's a little, it's a little Rico GR. Oh wow. Rico GR three. So it's basically just a little point and shoot. Uh, but, um, it's, the, the images out of it are incredibly sharp, and uh, it's a 28 mil equivalent. And I just like how low key it is because I'm I'm a yeah. I'm a coward on the street. I don't want to annoy anybody. I don't want to stress anyone out that I, you know I'm taking photographs. And and that's why I like that 28 mil so I can shoot the space rather than individuals. Right. So that I am I am sort of photographing interesting light and shadow. And if someone's there, they've walked into the shot. I I'm here waiting because yeah. I like, I'm fishing. So I like the space. I like what's going on. And if someone walks through and is in my photograph, you know, you can get upset with me and say, did you take my photograph? But most people just go, I'm really sorry. I walked into your photograph. So right. there's more an apology than a confrontation. So that all that sort of stuff is, is helpful. And I just walk, you know, I walk as far as I can as fast as I can, picking off things. And, and sometimes it's just to take a little visual note of something that's interesting, but the light's not quite right, then I can come back there on another day. So it's also this like cataloging idea of remembering spaces and what light's doing. Um, whereas portrait photography for me is totally different. That is, uh, you know, different cameras, it's lights, it's the rest of it. And it's, it has to be pre-visualized for me as much as possible. So I will often create a mood board for a project that I've got coming up. And I know exactly what I want to get. Whereas the street photography side is whatever I see is what I get and I'm leaving it to chance. The portrait stuff is I'm going to control, making sure I have the right subject, the right lights, the right, the right outfit, the right coloring, everything in the shot the way that I want it to be. So it's kind of the reverse yeah. um, on both ends for me. Yeah. Speaking of portraits, tell us about these portraits behind you here. The, oh, 
these are um, I actually did a video um, on these guys as well and, and sort of the making behind these portraits also the the mood board I collected for them as well um, they are three of my uh, mentors uh -huh. um, through the years I, I grew up uh, my dad left when I was quite young uh, about four years old and I think you know growing up as a, as a kid and as a teenager you're always looking for those people who'd step in the gap somehow and father you in small ways, even though it's not their job. And these are three of the people who did that for me. So, and they could, they actually came, there's an interesting story with them because, uh, I, I had, um, if you go, it's probably on my website and there's also a video on it where I went to Namibia and I took, uh, portraits with the Himba tribe. Um, oh, yeah. and I did that at a stage where, uh, I was looking at beautiful work from Steve McCurry and Salgado and people who would go around the world and find beautiful, interesting people and stories and take those photographs. And I thought, I need to try that and experience that and see if it's the way to go. And I took the photographs and I wasn't, I wasn't unhappy with them. You know, they, they were fine. I came back and I, I, I decided to print them nice and big. In fact, um, I've got them on the wall this side. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's three there of them printed are. there. Yeah. Amazing. And, um, I took the images to uh, Genesis Imaging here in London, who print um, a lot of the Magnum photographers here for exhibitions. And the head guy there, um, he, uh, the creative director there is a guy named Alex, and he said to me when he was printing these images off, he said, these are really good. These are technically really good, but I don't care about them, which was, you know, like, oh, that's, that, that's rough. Um, yeah. But he, he was very kind about it. He said, it's, it's, not that, it's not that, you know, the photographs aren't well taken. And I'm not criticizing your photography at all. It's that I don't feel your connection with this at all. I feel like you, you traveled around the world. You took technically competent pictures of very interesting looking people. And that's it. There's no, there's no story here that connects to you. And I thought, wow, that's a good challenge. So that's where these came about. Oh, it's yeah. the next trip I took was to go back to South Africa and to contact these three guys and say, can I just come and it will take 10 minutes. I just like to shoot an incredibly simple portrait, just black background, one light and, and see what, what this does for me. And I, I sort of documented that trip a little bit as well, that experience. And they feel totally different to me. Yeah. They, they feel like, even though the people in them aren't as, you know, startling and stunning in terms of, you know, their appearance and the, the photographs are much more simply lit and even edited they they feel like stronger work and i think some of that might be because of my connection to them so that's why mm -hmm. portrait wise for me and i've got a couple of portrait projects lined up now uh which are connected to my story deliberately so even, even if just tangentially because i feel that makes stronger work at least in my case i want to ask you about that but first of all how did you light that where was the light source was it a softbox or yeah, it's a, the, the, for this, it's a, um, a Lencarta 80 centimeter 16 pole beauty dish. So it's a collapsible beauty okay. dish with a white interior. Uh, it's got two interior diffusion panels and baffles, and it's got a grid as well. So I shot these uh, with, with the diffusion and the grid so I could keep the light off the background. And it's just traditional Rembrandt, 45 degrees, 45 degrees, and fire away. Do you have a uh, do you have an image or a video of that somewhere that we could uh, attach? Yeah. Okay. That yeah. would be great. Yeah. If, on my on my channel, if you go, there's a there's a video with the thumbnails, mentors, and uh, that's that's the one you'll okay. you'll see it. Let's ch definitely check that out. Well, you covered a lot of ground there, and I want to just sort of respond Sorry. to a couple <laughs> of things you said. First of all, I yesterday invited Steve McCurry. We'll see if he. Uh, I had a shoot scheduled with him. And unfortunately, at the last minute, he had um, his publisher coming in from Italy, so we had to reschedule it. So he, he has been scheduled, but that was a long time ago, so I'm trying to get him on the show. His, his photography is amazing. But you mentioned a lot of things, and one of them is, you know, we were talking about this before, it's just being true to your own voice. And I think having that connection is really a key factor. What do you think the difference was? I mean, obviously you knew, you know these these three guys behind you, but was there was there something more like philosophical within you that made a big difference in terms of having that connection? Um, I don't, 
I don't know. It's it's one of those things that's hard to define, isn't it? But, but sometimes I think when you do look at an image, especially a portrait in some ways, um, you can feel another layer to it because of, and, and maybe you can't figure out why. And, and again, it's one, it's one of those things that's very difficult to talk about because it's not quantifiable. So you can't teach people how to do this, um, I don't think. Um, I think you, the, the most you can do is, is for any portrait you shoot to try and get an honest moment, a chink in the armor with whoever you're shooting. Yeah. Where, where they're giving you something. I mean, I, I've talked about this in videos before, but I think it's, it's, um, it's to get that unguarded moment. That, 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 because everyone who sits down for a portrait, and, and especially models and actors, it's very hard to get an honest portrait of them because they're so practiced at giving you exactly what they want to give you and what they want you to see. And to direct them away from that to something more honest or open is, is very, very hard. It's often easier to get an honest moment with someone who, who isn't used to being photographed and is unprepared for that. Right. So it, it's, it's conversation and it's, it's drawing somebody out and waiting for that moment where they drop their guard slightly. And that could be in a gesture or an expression and it could be something that you don't know why. And, and I found that the response to that often is that whoever's having their photograph taken, that photograph often makes them feel uncomfortable when they first see it, 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 it because, because it is revealing in some way that they can't define either. And they're like, I'm not sure I like that one. And I have to try and talk them into taking that point usually. And, and my challenge to them is I know you might not like this, but I think this is more you. Go show this to your friends and family and see what they say about it and believe them if they tell you. This is more you. And if I can talk them into taking that one, those are the ones they'll thank me in a year's time for, but not on the day because it felt a little bit more revealing. So it's those kind of things. And I think you can feel that in a portrait. And I think with these, the reason I could do that more is because I know them, because we have history and we have story together, that while I'm talking to them and taking those photographs, I, I one know instantly when their guard's down because I know who they are and I know them as people. And two, I know how to, to, to recognize it's, it's even in just talking about our, our, our collective stories together and where we connect that you can, you can almost manufacture that guard coming down by bringing up something that you've experienced together that bonds you, that they go, oh, yeah, that. And there's mm -hmm. something in that, that dropping down that if you, could, if you can catch those moments. Again, like I, I don't believe that everyone who looks at those images go, oh, I, I, can, I can feel that. But I, I think some can and some do, and, and it's worth shooting for, even if – even if it's not something scientific that I can I can point to and test every time, and it, and it's and it's not something everyone will experience when they look at them. It's it's a it's still a target for me. You know, and and looking at two great portrait photographers, one Richard Avedon, who uh, was actually an inspiration for the second one I was going to mention, Annie Leibovitz, and Annie definitely doesn't try to. She even mentions this. She doesn't try to put her subject at ease. In fact, she's trying to dig that emotion. And like you said, she's photographing people who are usually very uh, used to being on camera and have a certain way of projecting and maybe a big smile. And she, if you look at her photographs, nobody's smiling. She's trying to get yeah. under the skin, under the surface. Richard Avedon did this in a very different way. And I, from what I understand, he was much more of a director when it came to the yeah. photograph. Um, yeah. Whereas Annie Leibovitz definitely does, from what I've heard, I haven't been with her on a shoot, but my understanding is she isn't really so much of a director. She sets, obviously she sets up the environment, but then mm. waits for that moment. So there are two different approaches. But I think you're right, trying to get past that surface. And, you know, it's interesting when you're when you're shooting in a third world country where people are not used to being photographed, you know, you know, that first moment, you usually get this very stiff smile and everybody's standing up very straight. Mm -hmm. And the trick is, how do you get past that? And so yeah. what I found worked was um, I would just keep shooting, but I wouldn't have the camera to my face. So I'm carrying on a conversation and they're not aware mm -hmm. that I'm being a photographer. I'm just somebody talking yep. with them. And th then I get the moments that I was really looking for. I mean, one of Annie's favorite shots for me is the shot of her mom, the portrait of her mom. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
That's which, her favorite I mean, photograph, mom, she said. Yeah. Which her mom doesn't like because it is too revealing for her mom. She's uncomfortable with it. It makes her look too old, she says. And it's like, but, but you know, you know when you look at that photograph, it's special, even if you don't know Annie or her mom, because yeah. there is that more to it. Yeah. And one thing about Annie is she photographs constantly. I mean, constantly mm -hmm. in environments I would never bring a camera. Mm -hmm. But she always has a camera with her. She said her favorite camera now is she's just uh, transitioned mm -hmm. into, you know, she had various different point and shoots and whatnot. But she said, look, we're all carrying around the iPhone. So that's what she yeah. shoots with when she's not using her Canon or whatever. So kind of this leads us to another point. But before we do that, let me just catch up some of the other people who have joined us. We've got uh, France, Jean. Yes, we're all locked down. This is why we're meeting up frequently, because yeah. Sean and I were talking about this. You know, my philosophy about these has become this should be like a little moment away from all our troubles. And. You know, photography as a as a form of creativity is an antidote to a virus is very destructive. And of course, it's very destructive through our culture. So the antidote to that is creativity. And, you know, we can counter that by, you know, strengthening our photographic skills and our creative skills during this time period, which is I'm glad that you guys are joining us for that reason. Um, so yes, we have Toronto, uh, more another person from Brazil. Um, let's, let's dive into, this is a question that just popped up. I'm gonna ask you, um, do you believe that there's a link between one's faith and one's photographic styling? Yes. But I, th I think it's more complicated than that. I think it's uh, I think your your faith or even lack of faith or or or, or, or your philosophy about how you see the it, it will shape how you see the world, all that stuff, um, and what you believe about different things and what you believe about people in particular, and I think that will lead you to particular subjects rather than others, and it might even lead you to tell stories from different angles than it would. So. I mean, something as deep as, 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 and again, I'm careful with the word faith because I understand that you know people don't like that and don't think of themselves as religious at all. You you, you will have a worldview, and I think uh, that's the important thing is is um, just taking that into account and owning it as well. If you've come to that over the course of your life and believe this is the way life, the universe, and everything works, to say, well, I I now want to express this in the work that I do. I want my voice to come out. And I want to show you the way that I see things and holding it loosely in case you're wrong and adapting the whole time and growing and all that good stuff. But yeah, I think, I think, yeah, absolutely. I, and if, and if it doesn't, I think you're not digging deep enough. I, I think it should, I think the way that you see the world should come out in the stuff that you make. Yeah. You know, maybe philosophy is a, an easier way to put it because hmm. I, yeah. I, I find the more I photograph, the more I'm, also in touch with my own philosophy like what what is it like you were saying you know we were talking about this before it's like being true to your own voice if you try mm -hmm. to photograph i mean look it's great to look at other photographers for inspiration we i totally encourage that i do that all the time yep. but having been inspired you still have your own voice and I, I, I think it becomes part of your philosophy as well. A good example of that is Ansel Adams. So mm -hmm. he actually used his voice as a photographer to help protect the environment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Not everybody could travel to Yosemite and, 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 and see its beauty, but because they could look at his photographs, he helped to encourage the um, establishment of other parks not only in the United States, but around the world. So he used his voice to help communicate the message of, look, we should, this is beauty that we've got to make sure it doesn't get messed up. Let's, yep. let's, let's keep it. And other photographers have used their voice in many different ways, um, you know, socially, politically, and so forth. And that obviously comes from a, a very, very 
a deep philosophy that they're that they're carrying forward with their photography. There's no doubt about that. It's it's like Salgado with his workers series. You yes, know? that's what he saw and that's what he cared about. So he went and he took photos and he showed us that because that's that's important to him and should be important to us. And he didn't even he wasn't heavy handed with it. He wasn't preachy with it. He just showed us. And yes. I think that's that's masterful. If you can if you can ride that line, I think it's really that's that's the gold standard for me. Yeah, exactly. Cartier Bersan is a great example of just giving us a glimpse into the time. And you know, we forget that you look at his work and it's like, of course it's a beautiful photograph because look at the cars are so old and the people are dressed, you know, but at the time he was taking those photographs, that was modern life. Just like the, mm -hmm. like we're walking around every single day in an environment that's unique to us or whatever it is we're seeing. In fact, somebody brought this up the other day, you know, okay, we're in this lockdown mode, but you know, you can go out, I'm sure, like at least here, even though we're in the, you know, shelter in place mode, we can still walk and go out and do things out of necessity. And you can certainly bring your camera with you and capture life as it is right now in 2020. That's a moment that may live on forever. And that's, that's another obligation or duty or responsibility that we have as photographers is, is capturing those moments. Yeah, I mean, I've been, I've sort of given a bit of the flip side of that here, though. I know because we're on a bit of a stricter lockdown, so I've been, I've been careful to sort of warn people here. I think in terms of, like you say, it's great to go out when you're going out anyway for something to take a camera. Yeah. But I, I'm also worried that some photographers are using it as, as an excuse and saying it's my responsibility to go into the center of London and take photographs. I think it's, it's, it's always a good thing just to put out and say that I think it's the, the photojournalist responsibility and those with commissions from newspapers to do that. And the rest of us should just limit it to our movements that are essential anyway. Like I, Agreed, the, the only yeah. thing I've done, the only thing I've done since this has started was yesterday. Uh, and it's the first time I left the house in five days was to go for some exercise and go for a walk for an hour. And I just walked around our streets here and all the kids have been uh, painting rainbows and putting them up in the windows here and facing them into the street, which is wow. lovely. So I, I took those on my little Rico in my pocket as I walked around and made a little story that I posted afterwards. And of course, the temptation is, oh, I could make this a much better story if I spend a couple more hours out here. I could send it to magazines. I could make a big name for myself. And I, I don't think it's the time for that. And I think we have to be like a little bit responsible about like letting the photojournalists who are commissioned do their job and us just limiting it to those essential trips. Yeah. Agreed. I've had so many questions about this. I just think it's such a good thing to say because I, I think yes, a lot of people are trying to use that excuse, you know. I think you're right. Yeah. And we do have a responsibility for the reason why we are locked down is to prevent the, the spread. And that's very important, obviously. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll just grab a couple of more from, uh, from our viewers here. But in terms of creating a, an image and actually this could apply to a, a still or your filmmaking um what do you think that je ne sais quoi what's that what's that secret sauce that uh brings that emotional connection because i think of your your films as having yeah. a very strong you know emotional connection there but what is it that you do that brings that about it's, it's funny because I separate out um, the filmmaking I do from the photography with that a little bit. Uh, I'm going to just close these curtains a little bit while I'm talking to you because sure. it's getting a bit fierce with the light. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I'm more um, uh, with the filmmaking. I'll start there because the, the, the photography I haven't worked out yet, if I'm honest. Um, the filmmaking that I do, I am more deliberate about trying to put across um, – a very particular message and I do want you to feel something about it I don't want it to be just information so I want it to be an experience that you go away feeling something alongside that info so I will I will script I script every video I put out I don't use the wording in that script I uh, I will um, print it out and uh, oh, here we go. I've got one right here for you hold on yeah, a sec. let's see that I'm curious so this is one that will that I'm going to be filming tomorrow that will go out next weekend and uh, this is uh, it's, it's just in sections uh, like this and basically what I'll do is I will take a section 
and I'll read it once and I'll put it down and then I'll say it to camera three times and then I'll just pick the best one afterwards. And the point isn't to remember the wording. The point is to just remember the flow. And the, the reason I write a script is not, not for the wording. It's to make sure that if I'm going to ask you to sit and listen to me ramble on for 20 minutes, I've got enough stuff to hold your attention and it's worth your time. So I, I do that for me and I do it in exactly the same way I would have prepared a sermon when I worked as a pastor in a church. It's, it's exactly the same methodology for me. It's, a, it's an intro. It's, it's three points I want to lead you through and a, and a benediction. I literally call it, that, I call it that in the script because I want it to be like a well-wishing, like, wow. a, like a, I, wish that, I wish for you that you now go out and you try this thing and it would improve your photography and you'd think about this thing. It would help you in your creative journey. So I try and tie it up with, with me wishing you well to take this thing that I've given you in this video and it improves your life even a little, a little way. And I try and say that in some form as well. So all those things to say, when, when, when I then layer on uh, B-roll, which I want to let breathe, that's what this video is about actually that's coming out in a week, is letting, that, letting the shots breathe a bit more than your average YouTube channel. Nice. Um, making sure that I can tie it in with some quotes from other people who've said similar things to say I'm not in this on my own. Here are greater people than me who've said something similar to ground it a little bit. And also the, the most important thing is the right music choice. I mean, that's everything for me. If, if, and that's often take, it can take me two hours to find the right track for a video because I, I can hear something I like um, and I know sort of what I'm looking for. But if, if I pull it in and I start to cut it and I realize, no, this is not, this is not, the feel of this doesn't match the feel of this. And I need to go back again. And of course, I need to start from scratch because you have to time that, those cuts to that music to, to make it all sync together. So all those elements, I am being very deliberate about communicating a message to you in a way that I want you to feel something because you'll remember it better if you feel something alongside it. Um, with the photography, it's different. Um, it's, it's, I, I don't think yet that I am a good enough photographer to do that is the truth. I think, I think um, I'm learning and I think that it will come out when I start shooting uh, longer term projects. When I, when I sort of sink myself into um, portrait projects about a specific group of people or I go out somewhere and I tell a photo story for a period of time sequencing those and putting those out together I think that's where that will come out for me more at the moment I don't think I'm very good at being deliberate about putting an emotional connection into an image that you're going to experience beyond the stuff I've talked about with these particular portraits and this is a first step for me this isn't even like you know this is this happened two years ago so this yeah. is early stuff and I'm still I'm still learning how to do that in the photography space. You know, Sean, I think it's you, you you've said something without saying it that is actually very powerful and very important. And that is to to kind of acknowledge that you're learning, even though you're a very accomplished photographer. And I think that's really important. The moment we sort of think, oh, I've got it. This is who I am. And we're never moving forward by learning something that's when that's yep. when it stops right the magic stops right there so that's that's fantastic we're going to take a couple of questions so um here's one about street photography uh the question is why do so many street photographs uh, appear to be black and whites <laughs> what do you think um the 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 unkind answer is that I think a lot of people go to black and white when they have a weak photograph to make it look better. I think that's <laughs> a trend that happens too often with people. And I think, I think that it's a, it's a quick fix for a weaker image. Um, I, I post on my Instagram, for example, the stuff that I put out regularly, it's always one color, one black and white, one color, one black and white alternating because I don't ever want to get stuck in one or the other and for the other to get weaker and it's it's i think it's a good challenge to um to put out there if you've decided that I mean, and i mean there are for, like we've been talking about salgado i think i think obviously that's not the case in his case that's a that's a conscious choice and he's journeyed far enough that we can go well it's not because he has a weak image he's trying in black and white or shooting with triax or what he right. happens to be doing that's not the reason, but I think a lot of starter photographers are doing that, and, and I know I did that. I know I did that at the beginning because everything looks sexier in black and white. So we have to be careful about why we do that, and I think it is too often 
a trick to rescue it, especially amongst beginners, which is why you see so much of it. That's my guess. And I, I, that's as honest as I can be. It might not be kind, but I think it's true. I think you're right. And I, I'm guilty of that. You know, there's times where I, I look at it and I go, you know, my here's my point of judgment, because I come from the black and white world of developing your own yeah. film and printing. And color meant you had to send it out to a lab. So I was pretty sparing in how many color photographs I took because I didn't yep. have the control for one thing yep. the way I did in the darkroom. And to me, when I first went into the darkroom, that was a magical moment because I'd been sending my film out to a drugstore and mm -hmm. it came back these little tiny prints that were very muddy, yep. low contrast. And then all of a sudden I took the same photograph and I printed it myself. I increased yep. the contrast. I did yep. whatever I, and it became a magical moment. So I'm, yep. I'm very grounded in, in black and white, but my determination is, does this photograph, is there a message that is better told because of the color within it or, yep. or because it's black and white? It's, it's more like a vision thing. Cause yes, does it, does it speak? If there's important color in it and that's part of its message, of course, I'm yep. going to leave it as a color photograph. But oftentimes that's not necessarily the case. So it becomes a black and white. And it's a conscious decision based on the on what I'm trying to tell my viewer. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly the same for me. If the color is important for some reason or there's interesting color in it, it stays. If the shape is is more interesting or the light is more interesting and the color is a distraction, it might go. It's, it's that simple. It is more visual for me as well, I think, yeah, in terms of the decision, yeah. Exactly. Well, listen, Sean, this has been fantastic. One last point. Is there is there a tip that you'd like to leave our audience with that you feel like could be of uh, particular importance for them in elevating or advancing their photography to the next level? I think, um, I think for anyone doing this sort of thing and journeying and, and I would assume you know um, your audience is probably similar to my audience it's a lot of people learning photography and sort of getting that getting their stuff together slowly journeying on teaching themselves it's to just it's to just keep going and be kind to yourself and I think I think to focus on the images that you're making and not the camera in your hand as much as you possibly can we, we all get kind of stuck in that early gear phase where we think that if we spend a lot of money or put cameras on credit cards we can't afford, it's going to take better photos for us. But taking your time to use the camera you already have and teach yourself how to frame well, how to expose well, all that kind of stuff, or how to tell a visual story well, you can do that with a phone. And I, and I mean that. Like uh, my Instagram, for the first half of my Instagram, it's all on my phone. And it, it's enough to teach yourself. If you can afford that camera, get that camera, but, but then stop thinking about cameras and start thinking about the images because the quicker you can get to that stage where you remind yourself that you know, you've, you've learned enough technical stuff, it's now time to work out what to point this at, that's when photography, for me, really started to get exciting. So I think, I think that's advice. <laughs> it's, it's definitely advice. I don't know if it's good advice. And that is really, yeah. really excellent advice. And it really resonates with our message on advancing your photography, because a camera is a tool and there's many tools that we can pick up, but your vision is you and it's your unique yeah. vision, the way you see things. So very important. Yeah. Sean, thanks again for joining us on advancing your photography to give us an inside look into your world. Really You're appreciate welcome. it. I'll ping you later. And again, thank you. We're going to look forward to, I'm really looking forward to that video that you mentioned that's coming up next week. We'll um, mm -hmm. send me a link so we can put it into the description. That would be awesome. Will do. Yeah. Cool. Thanks again. Thanks. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Bye. And to wrap things up for you guys, I want to thank you all from you know, really the bottom of my heart, I, I really love having you part of the show and bringing all, even if we don't answer your questions, believe me, we read them all, digest them and sort of put them into the mix. Now, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask Jared, who's in the background here, um, who should we pick? And he has a random pick. He has some kind of uh, hopper or something. We're not playing favorites to anybody. 
But uh, so Jared also wanted me to give a shout out to Alexander Ginsburg, who just uh, joined our community. Thank you. That's awesome. You know, you guys can click. There's a, a way that you can support this channel uh, under, I believe it's right under the button there. What is it, Jared? Just tell me what to say and I'll shout it out. But, but thank you for just doing that right now. And Jared is uh, going to pick somebody. In the meantime, while he's doing that, I want to mention a couple of things. So tomorrow, Dan Milner is going to join us again. You guys are all in love with him. If you haven't seen him yet, tune in tomorrow at 10 a.m. We'll carry on our discussion with him. And, um, you know, as always, you guys can help build this channel by telling your friends, bringing them along, subscribing if you haven't done that yet, enable the bell so you get uh, notified every time we have a new video. But, you know, this is something I'm, I'm really hoping we're building into a community and it's certainly getting that way because we're from all over the world. And, you know, photography can change the world. Certainly now we really see that it's, again, this passion that you can use as an antidote for some of the discomfort that we see going on around us. So like, share, leave your comments on the actual video. And again, we're going to digest all these. And Jared has picked somebody by the numbers. And it is Jack uh, A-R-C-E. <laughs> okay, Jack. So you're going to get a 16 by 24 metal print from Bay Photo. They'll contact you. Thank you once again for joining us. And we'll see you on the next show. But remember to get out and capture your own images of life. I love you guys. Thank you for joining us. Be well, be safe, and we'll see you soon.